but so we mentioned that the DMT experience is this this very overwhelming, very rapid 10, 15 minute kind of experience, right? It's very hard to bring anything back from. And you said you were kind of looking for a a kind of orally active version that might be might be slower. Uh, and as you say, mm -hmm. we now we know that ayahuasca right is a kind of a way of a slow release version of, of DMT. Um, and then you found that these the mushrooms which also we now know, right, uh, you mentioned the word tryptamine, that these, these all, all these chemicals are tryptamines, they're very chemically related, right? Um, and so did you find that it was taking high doses of the mushrooms took you to the, to the same kind of psychological space as DMT? Yes, yes. In fact, you know, we went looking for ukuhe because we thought it would be this, this big secret and and it turned out, I mean, it does have activity, but it's problematic. It's, it's very chemically variable because the plants, the varolas that uh, it's made from are actually quite variable, uh, even among the same species. That's partly what my uh, graduate work was about. I looked at a lot of different species. Ayahuasca is definitely a orally active form of DMT. But so are mushrooms, essentially, you know, I mean, as a, as a neuroscientist and probably a pretty good chemist, you know that, you know, uh, psilocin differs from DMT by one hydroxyl group, and that one hydroxyl group makes it orally active. So absolutely, it's the same, again, dimension. Maybe that's a bad word, but it's it's the tryptamine dimension, ayahuasca, DMT, the snuffs, uh, and high doses of, so psilocybin is, and that's something that we kind of realized in, in 81, that yeah, psilocybin is the, the perfect orally active form of DMT, you know, and if you push the dose, it's very hard to tell the difference, you know, it can be extremely intense you know, you can get to that place through psilocybin. Lately, I've been, uh, uh, I've experienced uh, using, uh, taking DMT in a vaporizer. Oh, really? uh, and that's, that's a pretty good way to do it too. If you have one of those volcano vaporizers or something similar, um, you know, you can fill the bag with smoke and then you don't have to deal with it. You can very finally titrate the dose and manage the dose, you know, and you can prolong it that way because you can keep taking it. You can take it, go up to a certain level and hang out there a while. And then you can say, okay, maybe I'll come back down or maybe I'll take another hit and go to the next level and look around there and go to the next level. So it really, uh, it's really a good way to do it because it gives you control over the experience and you can make it, just as intense or just as you know moderate as you want you can find your uh, you know your comfort zone it's sort of like right. floating around in a balloon actually yeah. <laughs> um and so with with dmt you know something like lsd i guess you you, you know is, is a fairly um it's found in you know it comes from this particular kind of fungus and it was you know it's kind of semi-synthetic it was extracted and synthesized but things like dmt and psilocybin you know, I think I've heard you say that nature is drenched in DMT, right? These tryptamines are throughout all different kinds of, of ecosystems, right? Like, what's your yes. um, feeling about, yeah, their place in the natural world? It might even be worth unpacking just some basic, you know, plant, plant biochemistry so people understand just how fundamental these, these chemicals are. Well, uh, here, here's the thing, it, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of a puzzle. It, it's like, you know, nature is drenched in DMT because because nature is drenched in tryptophan, you know, and tryptophan is the precursor for all of these tryptamines. DMT is only two steps away from tryptophan. And it's, and there are, uh, you know, two enzymes that are very uh, common in cellular metabolism. One is the, the, well, uh, aromatic amino acid decarboxylases. They remove the acidic group from tryptophan, which is an amino acid that yields tryptamine. And then other enzymes stick methyl groups onto, onto nitrogen. So those are the N-methyl transferases. These, 
these two enzymes are found in just about every cell in plants. And they're part of normal cellular housekeeping. Uh, and so as a result, because uh, DMT is so close to what we call primary metabolism, tryptophan is in every living organism. It, it's part of uh, you know, the 20 that go in to make proteins. So, so the, the, the precursor is there. And when, they, when, they, uh, when the enzymes are there, the substrate for it is there, then chances, you know, and the biochemical compartmentalization and all that is, is favorable, then the plant's going to make DMT. And, uh, you know, we know that, uh, you know, certain genera like mimosas and uh, acacias and uh, these sort of things, which are huge genera, acacia is about 1,200 species, mimosas around 400 or 500 species. Chances are 75% of those species contain DMT, you know, and or 5-methoxy DMT and or bufotenine, you know, these, these tryptamines tend to, uh, you know, they, 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 well, you know how plants are, they don't make one compound. It's rare that they do. They make a family of related compounds. And that's something that makes something like uh, the ayahuasca admixture plants, uh, uh, Psychotria viridis or Diploteris cabarena, the other one uh, that is used as the admixture plant north of the Putumayo to make what they, what, what they call yahe, which is you know, if there's a botanical difference, if the difference is the admixture plant. But those things are remarkable because they essentially only make DMT or they, if they make other things, there are only trace amounts. But because uh, the enzymes are so common and the substrate is universal, the precursor is universal, I speculate that probably all plants contain DMT you know, at some low level, you know, that, that we could detect. And then some of them just, you know, overexpress DMT, if you want to think of it that way, and we can use them. So I think the, the question of, of why, well, I guess the question of what it's doing, right, is something that, as far as I can see, seems to be entirely un, unresolved. Do you, do you think we're still at a stage where it's about speculating about what its function might be? What does DMT do for the plants? Yeah, and just the uh, ecosystem there, as a whole. Yeah, there are some there are some interesting uh, there are some interesting speculations and and some interesting work going on. Uh, I mean, obviously, most of these so-called plant secondary compounds they have a role in the ecology. You know, they can be repellents. Uh, they can be attractants. They can, a lot of times, uh, you know, most symbiotic relationships between plants and other organisms, like plants and insects, for example, are mediated through these chemical signal transduction processes. And I think DMT is something like that. And, 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 and a lot of these things have, have multiple functions, depending on the situation. Some of them, I mean, sometimes they may be repellents, you know, and they're, or toxins, you know, and their function is protective, but, you know, against say bacteria or fungi or, or things that might want to nibble on them. But uh, in other cases, in other situations, the same compound might be an attractant or it might be something that initiates a symbiotic relationship. So it depends on what organism and you know what the compound is and what the situation is. A friend of mine uh, uh, who is a plant uh, photobiologist uh, at Stanford, we recently did a uh, presentation at the Science of Consciousness um, forum, which was usually, usually held in uh, Arizona at Tucson every year. It's a huge conference. There's like 2000 people participating. This was virtual, obviously, this time, but he's been doing some very interesting work on the tryptamines as, as, uh, and photobiology. And the, the, the tryptamines may be related to uh, the, the uh, regulation of the circadian rhythms in the plants an interesting melatonin, right, in the pineal gland, also a tryptamine, right, uh, 
is involved in our photoperiodism and so on. Well, plants are exquisitely uh, attuned to, you know, uh, light, obviously, because they live on light. And they're ex exquisitely attuned to these cycles, you know, that are regulated by, by plant hormones like auxin, another, another indole, which controls the uh, sort of morphogenesis and shoot elongation and all this in the plants. And he is beginning to look into work that, that shows that uh, uh, DMT and some of these tryptamines are photoregulatory uh, factors. Uh, I can, I, I don't pretend to totally understand it, but I can certainly link you to his, yeah, his papers. Great. And this makes sense, you know, it makes sense that that's why it's there. That's what it does.